and welcome to day one of English 2332, Literature of the Western World from the Bronze Age to the Renaissance. I'm Dr. Eric Luttrell. I'll be your professor for the next 15 weeks. This is the introductory lecture for the spring semester of 2015 here at uh, Texas A&M University in Corpus Christi. As you may already know, we had a total power outage across the campus yesterday, and all afternoon classes were canceled. It's a slight nuisance, but it provides us with an opportunity to test our academic continuity. That's the term we use for what happens when a hurricane hits the island during the semester. Uh, we're on an island and we do have to have contingency plans for how to keep the university operating in the case of a storm or a flood. And Blackboard and video lectures like this one are one way we can do that. In this course, we're going to cover more than 3,000 years of literature, starting in Mesopotamia, what is today Iraq, with the story of Atrahasis, which was written on clay tablets around 1650 before the Common Era, and derived from oral stories that are even older than that. We're going to go all the way from there to William Shakespeare's play The Tempest, which was one of his last plays written around 1610 of the Common Era. Uh, you will need to buy paper copies of five books all five of which are listed on the syllabus and available in the Tamu CC bookstore. The first one you'll need is Myths from Mesopotamia, which contains the readings we'll be doing for the next two weeks. You won't need the other four until week six, so if you're ordering online, you have some time. In order to save you some money, I've selected the rest of the readings from free texts that are in the public domain and available online. Some of these translations date back to the beginning of the 20th century, and their language is deliberately archaic. That may make them difficult to read, so if you've already purchased more modern translations, uh, particularly the Iliad, the Odyssey, or Hesiod, uh, you can use those to do the readings, so long as they are line-by-line -line translations and not just some summaries or retellings. I've put links to the free texts on Blackboard. You can download most of them f uh, for a Kindle or an e-reader if you prefer. If all these options look confusing, uh, you can download all the digital readings in one PDF that I've posted on the class's Blackboard site. So you'll need to go to the uh, to log into Blackboard using your Islander ID and password. Uh, that's the same login uh, information you use to check email. Uh, here on Blackboard, you can find my contact information. Uh, you can find list of books you'll need to buy. Uh, a list of books that you can download for free and the course syllabus. The syllabus is the most important thing. It contains all the information you need to know about the design of the course. It describes the papers you'll have to write, the quizzes and exams you'll have to take, the classroom policies and course objectives. Since there are formatting issues on Blackboard, you should download and open the PDF link at the top. Uh, save the PDF. I, I also recommend you print it out. There will be a quiz on Tuesday that will cover the syllabus, among other things, so read it well. You'll also see a link on the left to the reading schedule. If you downloaded the syllabus PDF, uh, there's a copy of the syllabus, I'm sorry, a copy of the schedule on it. But if you want the schedule by itself, you can download it here. Uh, notice that your first reading is due on Tuesday. It's the story of Atrahasis, and you can find it in the Myths from Mesopotamia book from pages 1 to 34. Remember that the readings are due on the day that they're listed, not afterwards. After we finish the Myths from Mesopotamia book, we'll begin using digital text. You can download your preferred file types here, or you can download the PDF course reader here, uh, here at the top. When you download it, it should look like this. If you don't already have it, Adobe Acrobat Reader is available for free at adobe.com. The address is here on the top left of the screen. When you open the PDF, you can click the ribbon icon on the left to, uh, to, to open up the bookmarks menu. This is the easiest way to navigate through the document. You can also click the titles in the table of contents uh, to go directly to that reading. 
if you don't like to read on a computer screen, you can print this out. Upstairs at the library, you can get them to print large portfolios like this. Uh, it will cost about $25, but that might be worth it if you really don't like reading on a screen. The first digital text we'll read is the book of Genesis. I know you probably already have a translation of Genesis in your own Bible at home, but for the purpose of this class, we'll want to all be on the same page, in this case, literally. The version included here is the New Oxford Annotated Bible, and uh, it's those annotations that are going to prove very important in our study. It uses the New Revised Standard Version, which, as the name suggests, is the standard version for most scholars and theologians. So let's talk about literature. Or rather, let's talk about how stories work. We all know who this is, right? Ask your average person and he'll tell you this is Frankenstein. A clever few might say this is Frankenstein's monster rather than Frankenstein himself. Uh, what else do we know about him? Well, we know that the monster was created by Dr. Frankenstein. Uh, he was stitched together from the corpses of dead people and brought to life by a bolt of lightning or some sort of electricity. Dr. Frankenstein did this with the help of his hunchback assistant, Igor, in a laboratory filled with sophisticated machines deep in Cap uh, Castle Frankenstein. The result is this slow moving, slow thinking, robot like human that can, or humanoid, that can barely put together a sentence. These are the first details that come to mind when we think about Frankenstein and his creation. However, almost none of these elements of, Franken of the Frankenstein story come from the novel where that story originated. In Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus, we are never told how the creature is brought to life. Shelley never mentions, mentions harnessing lightning. Uh, Igor does not appear in the novel. There is no castle Frankenstein and no laboratory. Victor Frankenstein, he's not Dr. Frankenstein, he hasn't even graduated from college yet. Uh, Victor has constructed the creature's body and leaves it lying on the table while he passes out from exhaustion. When he wakes up, the body is gone. The creature is alive and on the loose, but Victor never even sees it happen, much less chanting maniacally, it's alive, it's alive. Most of these elements that are not in the novel come from the 1931 movie directed by James Whale that stars Boris Karloff as the creature. Uh, that film was based on a play which was based on Mary Shelley's novel. Each time the story was adapted, it took on new elements. Each new writing and or new writer and director uh, filled in the gaps, the things Shelley never mentions, but they also rewrote major elements. And very few of us know the story from seeing the 1931 film. We've seen the adaptations of adaptations of adaptations of adaptations. And these adaptations have added more than just Igor and the lightning machine. They have added moralistic interpretations. Most people will tell you that Frankenstein is about how scientists try to play God. They meddle with nature and create monsters that only cause destruction. The moral is that we shouldn't meddle with nature. This is the moral that James Whale's film really beats us over the head with, but it's not a very good description of Shelley's novel. In the novel, the only thing Victor Frankenstein really does wrong is reject his creation. At first, everything about the creature is good except his appearance. He's faster and stronger than any human being, and he uh, becomes very articulate very quickly. The only thing he can't do is find someone who will treat him like a human. People see his appearance, and they scream at him. They call him a monster. They attack him, even get shot, uh, all while trying to reach out to people. Eventually, he gives up trying to connect to other people and turns to hurting people the way that they expect him to. In Shelley's novel, it's not science that creates the monster. It's us, everyday human beings who re react to appearances rather than thinking with open minds. The next time you hear somebody use fr the Frankenstein story to try to prove that stem cell research or genetically modified foods are dangerous, you might tell them to read the book. But it's hard to push through all of these later preconceptions and read the text as it is when we already think we know the story. We project those preconceptions onto the text and sometimes we don't even notice that there never was a lightning machine. Like archeologists, we have to dig through so many layers of more recent accumulations before we can see a text as it was seen in the place and time that produced it. 
well, we're not going to be reading Frankenstein in this class. It falls a few centuries outside of our time period. Our texts are even older, but that means they've had even more time to accumulate a lot of modern baggage. One of the texts uh, that we're going to read is the Old English poem Beowulf. Most people have heard of Beowulf, and you may have uh, even read a modern English translation. But Beowulf is one of those stories that is highly susceptible to the lightning machine effect. It's a medieval story about a Viking-like warrior, he's not a Viking, but he's close enough to our image of a Viking, who fights monsters and dragons and discovers buried treasure. That makes the text of the Old English poem seem susceptible to all of the conventions of the modern fantasy genre. To be fair, much of uh, the fantasy genre grew out of the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, like The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Tolkien was an Old English scholar, and he knew Beowulf inside and out. He drew a lot of inspiration from Beowulf and other Old English and Old Norse literature. But that doesn't mean that familiarity with fantasy games and novels will help us understand Beowulf. In fact, it's likely to get in the way quite a bit. The same goes for Beowulf movies. There have been several. One even put Beowulf on a spaceship. Uh, the, more, the most familiar one is the animated movie from 2007 that had Angelina Jolie playing Grendel's mother. All of these movies had to make a decision about what Grendel looks like. And that's because the poem doesn't tell us what he looks like. It tells us that he had glowing eyes and sharp claws. And from a distance, he and his mother looked vaguely human. But that leaves a lot for the director to fill in. Was he a zombie type creature like the 2007 movie suggests? Or maybe something like an ogre? Or was he just like a big guy? Whatever images we 21st century readers have in our heads, they're probably not something the poem's early audience would recognize. So we want to try and peel away our modern preconceptions when we approach the text. However we decide to imagine Grendel, we have to be aware of the difference between what the text says and what we imagine. We have to recognize what's not in the text as well as what is. Every text leaves the reader a lot of gaps to fill in. If we're reading for enjoyment, we can fill in those gaps any way we want. But as literary scholars, and for the purposes of this class, that's what you are, as a literary scholars, we have to be careful to interpret the text according to its earlier contexts. That's why it's important to distinguish between three different concepts, the text, its context, and its subtext. The text consists of the words on the page. In Beowulf, that means the Old English words on the only manuscript that we have found that tells Beowulf's story. Only having one manuscript actually makes it easy to isolate one text from others. Other texts we're going to read get a lot trickier uh, because they're compiled from fragments. Uh, but even with Beowulf, we'll be reading a translation, which by its very nature inserts concepts and interpretations that are foreign to the original. Still, the text you'll be reading won't tell us what Grendel looked like or what Beowulf looked like for that matter. We'll have to fill in the gaps using context. Context is information that we pull from outside the text and use to figure out what's going on inside the text. We have two choices. We can use our personal context. In Beowulf, personal context would be all that we learned from movie versions, uh, The Lord of the Rings, games like Skyrim, and that sort of thing. You can do that when you read on your own, but for this class, we're gonna have to do something much harder. We're going to have to learn enough historical context to try to interpret the story the way people did 1,000 years ago when the story was first written down. We want to know what context the author was using, but we don't want to stop there. The authors don't speak for their whole societies. They have particular points of views. They have likes and dislikes. They have loyalties to certain characters and prejudices against others. For example, we'll be reading the story, uh, the saga of uh, the Danish king Rolf Kraki. Uh, which, you know, the saga makes him uh, a hero. But then we're going to read about the same character in Beowulf. And in Beowulf, Rolf, or Rothulf, is a dark figure who lurks in the background, threatening to usurp the throne. We want to learn as much historical information as we can, not to see which version of King Rolf was the real one. They're both fictionalized. But we want to see how each version developed. We figure out what historical context was by looking at the other uh, other things people wrote about uh, around the same time the text was first written. We can also use what we know from archaeology, geography, physics, uh, sorry, psychology, and other human sciences to learn about the text's historical context. 
that lets us figure out more about the interpretation process that the people who read it back then were using. Our knowledge of historical context will help us figure out things the author doesn't specify. Uh, this allows us to infer some things that the text doesn't say, to read between the lines. The space between the lines is what we call subtext. When telling a story, the narrator will not tell us things that the average member of the audience would be expected to know. We call this the silence principle. Because the silence principle is in effect, there will be a lot of subtext for the reader to figure out. But our historical context is different. So we ha have to test the assumptions that we use to fill in the subtext. We use the principle called Occam's razor. That's a strategy for comparing competing explanations for the same thing. If one explanation requires fewer assumptions to make sense, it's probably the better explanation. When it comes to subtext, we want to find the simplest explanation possible in the given context. So we have to fill in the subtext using the context that's available to us, but some of our context doesn't fit. It's like putting together a puzzle when some of the puzzle pieces are missing and some of the pieces came from another puzzle and aren't going to fit at all. This brings up some important questions. Where do our assumptions come from and which assumptions can we safely rely on? How do we infer meaning without imposing it on the text? How can we block out preconceptions long enough to hear the narrative as it was told at a place and time distant from our own? And can we trace a story as it evolves from one narrative manifestation to another? This last question may be trickier than it appears. Notice I'm differentiating between story and narrative. We hear these words used in common discourse to mean the same thing, but for our purposes, they're two different things. A story is the event or sequence of events that is described. The narrative discourse is the description. It is how the story is conveyed. When two people witness the same car accident, they'll be uh, likely to describe it very differently. One witness may say that the red car bumped into the blue car, while another witness will say that the red car slammed into the blue car. When it comes to describing why the event happened, the descriptions will be even more different. We always have our own ideas about what other people are thinking and why they do the things they do. The author of a text operates like a witness of a car accident. He has to make decisions about what to mention and what to leave out. He will usually try to explain why things happen the way they did when another author may believe the same events happen for different reasons. What each author writes is the narrative. The events that happened are the story. Unfortunately, we can never have direct access to the story itself. Literary scholar H. Porter Abbott puts it this way. We never see the story directly, but instead always pick it up through narrative discourse. The story is always mediated by a voice, a style of writing, camera angles, actors' interpretations, so that what we call the story is really something we construct. But most stories, if they succeed, that is, if they enjoy an audience or readership, do so because they have, to some extent, successfully controlled the process of story construction. Since modern fiction usually starts with a single author making up a story from her own imagination, we tend to think of many stories as having a starting point. The way I described Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, I may have made it sound like her novel was the real story and everything that came after it was an imperfect copy. But if that, that was the case, uh, we would call it an Ur text. An Ur text is a single original that preserves the real or genuine story that all later versions derive from. The problem is for the text that we're going to read, we never get an Ur text. Every story is based on other versions. The written texts are almost all based on other written works, and those are based on oral tradition. Oral tradition is all of the previous versions that were spoken or sung by poets, people like Homer. Those poets had all sorts of ways of keeping the narrative the same from one telling to the next, but even with all of that, all of that fidelity, the narratives still differ uh, as different people tell them at different points in history. Each of these tellings is an iteration. An iteration is one particular narration of a story in a text, song, movie, play, illustration, uh, etc. You can remember this term by the more common word reiteration. When we reiterate something, we say it again. 
but we don't always say it the exact same way. For each narrative iteration, the narrator, the author or the poet, pulls a vast pulls from a vast body of knowledge about a particular story. We call this the multiform. It consists of all the different story elements that a narrator can choose from to tell one iteration of the story. Since our Frankenstein example, uh, or in our Frankenstein example, the multiform that contains the Frankenstein story contains the lightning machine and the laboratories in Castle Frankenstein and Igor and everything else that is not in Mary Shelley's novel, uh, as well as the stuff that did appear in Mary Shelley's novel. In Beowulf, the Anglo-Saxon poem tells the earliest version that has survived, but it's still not an Ur text. When author John Gardner tells the story from Grendel's point of view, or when Neil Gaiman makes the dragon in the 2007 movie uh, into Beowulf's son, spoiler alert, these are the new narrative iterations, but they pull from the same multiform uh, of the Beowulf story. That means that at one time, somebody like Homer selected some stories about the Trojan War and some versions of characters like Achilles and Odysseus to put together into the narratives of the Iliad and the Odyssey. An understanding of that multiform will turn out to be extremely important. When we read parts of each poem, we will find many allusions to other stories, people, and places that we may never have heard of before. Homer assumes that we already know who these people are and what the stories about them say. But when we first read these poems, we have no idea what these stories are. That's why we have to dig through the historical context to see what pieces are necessary to read the narrative that is linked to a much larger multiform. We will always have to stitch together stories and read the subtext as carefully as possible. So our goals as literary scholars may not be what most people think they are when they take a class like this one. We all love literature and we're not hopefully going to lose our love of literature, but just reading stories for the love of it is not, unfortunately not one of our primary goals. You don't have to take a college class to enjoy reading. It's, our goal is not to uh, learn a plot uh, or learn a summary of a plot. Of course, understanding what happens is essential to studying the narrative, but it's just the first step. If you want to read a plot synopsis on Wikipedia or sparksnotes.com before you read the text, go ahead. But knowing what happens is not the same as seeing how it is narrated. Our goal is not to decode a text. A text is not a code that tries to say something other than itself, or at least it's not necessarily something. Uh, a code that tries to say something other than itself. The text is a thing to be valued for itself, not something to be replaced with another text. That's why we're not looking for the one true meaning. You make the meaning for yourself and you make it from your personal context. But that meaning that you find is not the meaning that is inside the text, if there is one at all. And it's not going to be the same meaning other people who read it from different personal contexts. We're also not trying to find the moral of the story. It's true, these stories have a lot to teach us, but as we'll see, those lessons can be very different from one narrative to another, even when they're telling the same story. Our goals are more focused. We want to carefully and critically reconstruct stories from the narratives that tell about them. We want to study the ways narrative choices have shaped interpretations of stories from ancient times to the present. We want to study the evolution of stories through different narrative interpretations and the social, historical, economic, and ideological context that shape those interpretations. We want to understand the elements of narrative discourse that remain constant across cultures and time periods. And we want to understand the function of storytelling in human society and the ways in which narrative choices shape our perception of reality. And these goals aren't only relevant to stuffy academics. Understanding why people tell stories, how they put together, uh, put them together into particular narratives, and how they read and apply them is essential to understanding how the human mind works. As film director Brian De Palma put it, people don't see the world before their eyes until it's put in a narrative mode. 
And that's not a new thing, and it didn't start in Hollywood. We're going to learn to see ancient worlds the way our ancestors saw them. And we're going to do it by learning the stories through which they saw themselves and through which they saw their world. We're going to start with the story of Atrahasis. This is a text about the Great Flood that was written down a millennium before the Genesis story of Noah. It comes down to us carved in the ancient language of cuneiform on the clay tablets. Actually, it survives in pieces on broken fragments of clay tablets. That's why you will find lines of the text that are incomplete or missing. This will be our first exercise in filling in the gaps. But I'm looking forward to the semester, and I hope you are too.